Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I've got to start by responding to the previous speaker because um, a lot of what he said was just wrong. It is, of course, the case that uh, all universities in this country do set targets. They're required to set targets of various types by the Office for Fair Access um, as a, as, uh, um, as, uh, uh, because, they, because they charge fees, they're required to do this. And I looked up this afternoon the Office for Fair Access um, targets for Cambridge and uh, Oxford. For Cambridge, it starts, and you can look this up yourself, it starts by saying, the university's principal objective is to increase the proportion of UK undergraduate intake from schools in the UK state sector. And they set a target, actually, of 62%, um, which they based on the uh, A-level grade profile of all students in this country who might apply for the courses that they offer. And as we've already heard, they actually last year reached 63%, so they've already overtaken their target. That is their principal target, and it's worked. I don't approve of their target, but there it is. Now, Oxford uh, takes a more intelligent approach than Cambridge, as you might expect. Um, <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect that. Well, I would. But, uh, <laughs> So Oxford's, Oxford sets three targets, you know, and all of you in this room have been influenced to some extent by these targets. One, to increase the percentage of your students who come from schools that historically have limited progression to Oxford. Secondly, to increase the percentage from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. And thirdly, to increase the percentage from neighbourhoods with low participation in higher education. That is Oxford's three targets. And then it goes on to say, and this is the most important single point, probably, that anyone's going to make this evening. <laughs> and I'm quoting directly from your university's access agreement. We completely reject the notion of independent state targets. Evidence shows that this measure is misleading as an indicator of social diversity. There are students from relatively wealthy backgrounds at state schools and students from relatively disadvantaged ones at independent schools. 30% of the 2012 entrants in receipt of the full Oxford bursary, that is students with a household income of £16,000 or less, a third of our candidates were educated in the independent sector. So the, propos the proposals of this motion are suggesting that this group should be, in part, debarred from this university. Both Oxford and Cambridge actually are very successful at meeting their targets. The point is, these targets exist, they're already working, and I'm not sure you need much else. I ask myself, well, what actually does Oxford University want, want out of their admission system? I'm not interested in what the government wants, I'm not interested in what Nick Clegg wants. What does this university want? And you ask any Don here, they say, what we want, is the students with the best potential for the degree courses that we offer, plus a few who can row well. <laughs> <coughs> well, you know, how do you get, the, the, how do you identify the pupils with the best potential? Well, what most universities do, and what Oxford, I'm sure, does, is you do a statistical analysis of the degree results of Oxford students over 10 years, and you correlate that with their GCSE results and their A-level results, and you then break all of that down by school type and gender and ethnicity and so on, and then you work out what are the best predictors of success. And if you find that there are certain sorts of schools that, uh, from which their pupils underperform, you raise the bar a bit. Um, independent schools, grammar schools maybe, maybe sixth form colleges, uh, maybe schools that always get very good exam results, uh, maybe pupils from London, maybe white males. You just look at all of these things and you adjust the bar slightly. That's what all sensible people, that's what I did when I was the headmaster uh, in, in respect of the pupils coming to my school. That's what you do. You have to be careful, you do it intelligently, but you don't have quotas. Uh, I looked up the figures for Oxford last, this last year, 2014. The English department this year admitted 164 women and 76 men. Do you want quotas so that the men who can't read get admitted here? Remember that <laughs> quotas at Oxford and Cambridge have to be mediated through subjects 
and through college. You couldn't leave it to chance. So what it would mean if you had quotas is that every, every subject at every college would have to be told you've got to take this many pupils from an independent school, this many from a state school, this many males, and so on. That's the thing about quotas. And the other thing I think that you know, Oxford as a university wants is for its subjects to flourish. The subjects, the limited range actually of subjects that you offer here to flourish. And a lot of those subjects depend heavily on independent school pupils. I mean, obviously classics, but also, you know, a high proportion of modern languages and chemistry and physics and so on. And if you have quotas, what, what, what's going to happen to the quality of these vital subjects? Rather than have quotas, why don't you find out what state schools could do better and then fix it? And, you know, all the research shows, and the Sutton Trust is probably the principal authority in this, that state schools don't encourage uh, enough students to apply, um, they don't provide adequate preparation for them, that state school pupils do the wrong A-level subjects, and above all, as far as Oxford is concerned, that state school pupils apply disproportionately for the most popular subjects, so they find it much harder to get in. And so what should be done? The answer is the university should tackle these problems head on, which is exactly what they're doing. Three years ago, I set up a free school in the East End of London um, with the specific aim of trying to increase the number of students coming from Newham who went to Oxford and Cambridge. And last summer, we got our first set of exam results, A-level results, and my one little school doubled the number of students coming from Newham to this university. And so I uh, emailed my head of Oxford admission at the London Academy of Excellence and asked him what he felt about this motion. Um, and this is what he said. We at the London Academy are committed to making a, a difference. It would be a strange outcome if our hard work in this area were to become essentially meaningless because quotas now meant that generating academic interest in our pupils was no longer necessary for achieving an Oxbridge place. What is more, if Oxbridge makes it easier for state pupils to get in, the incentive to improve the state sector would go. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, you can have all sorts of quotas and there are all sorts of groups, I'm sure, who are underrepresented at this university. Uh, the, uh, state school pupils, yes, but think about also middle class pupils, overrepresented, pupils from grammar schools, overrepresented, white students, overrepresented, uh, women in some subjects, men in others, pupils from Surrey. You know that the county of Surrey, <laughs> the county of Surrey this year sent more students than Oxford than the whole of Wales and the northeast of England combined. <laughs> so perhaps we should have. Quotas for pupils from Surrey, <laughs> or are all quotas the sort of thing that two of the world's leading, leading universities should reject? Thank you. <laughs>